are going to take you through a little bit of research, a little bit of practice, a little bit of praxis, and is there anything you want to add to introduce yourself? Um, yeah, hello everybody. Um, yeah, I guess just a very short summary of why I'm up here. Uh, with Lindsay speaking about this topic. Um, so I've always, I've always loved nature. Um, that's always kind of been a big part of my life. And as I got older, I kind of transferred that to a, an academic career, PhD uh, in ecology, and then yeah, the start of my my undergraduate uh, degree. Uh, it was a heavy time when uh, I was at Imperial in London, and, and psilocybin mushrooms were legal at the time. So you could just walk into a, the high street in Camden and order fresh tubs of mushrooms, because legally at the time, they, for some reason, Camden is a, is a fresh food stuff. Um, and I won't go into the details of that. My first encounter involved going to the nightclub fabric and not to the uh, which it's uh, I don't know, like textbook for you know first time, but uh, good stuff was learned regarding set and setting and all those fundamentals of using psychedelics. Um, but it kind of kindled an interest in me, and I eventually ended up at this conference, uh, Breaking Convention. It's a biannual psychedelic conference, and the guy, Dr. David Luke, um, gave this presentation looking at how psychedelics can affect people's relationships with nature, their connections to, to nature, and also potentially kindle pro-environmental, pro-ecological awareness. And I wasn't aware of any work being done um, on that, and that's because I think he was, he was one of the pioneers of that um, sort of research area. And that really kind of lit me up because it was kind of the intersection of two areas or fields that were really interesting to me, ecology and psychedelics, and I was like, okay, this is a funky intersection um, in terms of things to be working on, and that kind of, yeah, with a bit of encouragement from David and support, that was my on-ramp to, to being involved in uh, the research in this area. And I came to psychedelics kind of through a circuitous route. I did my MPhil here in psychology, looking at interreligious violence and virtual reality actually as a mechanism to reduce violence between groups in Central African Republic. And I spent 15 years in documentary filmmaking, primarily in really complex humanitarian crises and mostly in Africa, some in India. Um, and so a long, a long time of really looking at, okay, what kind of predicts changes in behavior and how to really sustainably see shifts in one's cognitive kind of structures that open up new opportunities to see enduring changes that really make a difference in places with acute suffering and, and challenge and conflict. Um, and after my master's, I was kind of going through my own kind of personal shifts and became really curious in the research around psychedelics and was just quite surprised to see how much, um, yeah, really solid research existed. And I came from a family of, you know, very much like in the drug war and war against drugs. And I like won the fifth grade competition for writing an essay for D.A.R.E., um, which is a U.S. program like of drug awareness. And so I grew up like really quite scared of drugs. <clears throat> and so seeing kind of the efficacy of psychedelics to create mystical experience, to create mental health improvements, and then further on to see how it could actually predict um, and encourage nature connection became really interesting to me. Long story short, I had my first experience with psilocybin at a legal retreat center in the Netherlands. And now, fast forward four years, I'm on that team facilitating psychedelic retreats. So my research here at Cambridge is not looking at psychedelics, but it is looking at nature connection. And some of what we'll talk about tonight kind of leaves both the research side and then I'll share a bit more of what we do at the synthesis retreats to use um, the earth to work with nature, both in preparation, the ceremony itself, and integration, and what that can kind of open up for for deepening our love of the earth and all of that entails. So that's a little bit about us. And I wanted to start this um, 
evening by kind of couching what we're talking about, which we like our little summary was, you know, the dual crises that we're facing, mental health, you know, in the year, I think it was 2019 in the U.S., an epidemic of loneliness was declared. We're, of course, in the midst of climate collapse. And so how are these really connected? And psychedelics have been hailed as, you know, there's all of this potential incredible benefit, which is true, but there is a lot of caution to be taken. And so wanting to look at this not just as the next best opportunity for self-help and self-well-being, but could it be colonization by another name? And, you know, the extraction, the for-profit, the ills of modernity that have gotten us into a place where we are, you know, pretty far away from a 1.5 degree future, I think have the same potential to ruin um, what psychedelics could be asking and offering us um, to really change the way we're living here so that we actually have the opportunity to stay here. And not just humans, you know, like really breaking away from a human-centric view and what is it to be connected into this really wide, beautiful web of life. Um, and so instead of psychedelic evangelism, we really want to orient this conversation with respect to the indigenous origin and use of plant medicines, which are primarily in cultures um, in South America and elsewhere, used really to help people wake up and sober up and mature and then contribute to their communities, to their families, to the world. It's not really about an individual feeling better. I mean, that's a beautiful byproduct, but that's you know a way that we like to think in the West, like how can I be better? And I think so much of what plant medicines offer is there's no such thing as the individualized I. Um, there is a we, and it's this interconnectivity that um, could deepen and change the way we actually are here. So respect for the limits of the planet as well. It's not an endless um, source of resources. Respect for our entanglement and respect for right relationship. Thanks, Lindsay. Um, I think it's important to kind of frame um, the disconnection from nature in a kind of wider context of which it's a part. So, you know, our civilization as it exists now is the result of a progression in a certain direction underpinned by certain values, societal values, Western societal values. And they encompass things such as uh, fierce individualism, materialism, consumerism, uh, technological kind of um, wielding of technology, and unfortunately, uh, things such as materialism are inversely correlated with uh, connection, with psychological connection, uh, and also well-being and happiness, and. It seems from some of the work that's being done that connectedness is a part of a kind of broad spectrum. So connectedness to, to self, to ourselves, to our senses, um, uh, connectedness to other people, otherwise known as social connectedness, which is known from the research literature to be a very powerful buffer against things like depression, um, and then nature connectedness uh, as well connecting this to nature and we'll kind of sort of get into to what that actually uh, entails. But, you know, and I don't want to oversimplify things, but, you know, we've got, as Lindsay um, stated, we have a mental health crisis and we have an environmental crisis, I mean, technically multiple environmental crises. And it seems to me, um, from some, some of the research that's been done, that disconnection is the root of these problems. Um, and it's kind of, unfortunately, disconnection is woven into the fabric of our societal ideals. Not like knocking some aspects, you know, I, I, I've enjoyed and um, benefited from the fruits of our civilization. I mean, it's like, it's born amazing fruits. 
and we're all living longer. We have access to amazing medicines. We have all these material comforts and amazing technology and, and these opportunities. We've gone into space. We've split the atom. Uh, we've achieved wondrous, amazing things. Um, but this progression in this certain direction has come at a cost. And in our pursuit of material gold, in a sense, we've kind of forgotten that our gold as human creatures is connection. We are wired for connection. We have brains that are wired for connection, connection to our environment, connection to our tribe, to our community. And we sort of brought, move that aside thinking that's sort of not important, whereas the pursuit of materiality is where it's at. And that's, um, that's come a tremendous cost, and I feel like the, the bill is coming due for that. Yeah, and so with that, even though this is a talk on psychedelics and nature connection, we both really feel strongly that nature connection is kind of the key, and psychedelics can be a really beautiful and powerful catalyst for nature connection, but we're wanting to kind of center nature connection as, as still kind of the point. Um, and there, it's like, you know, Bill Richards, who's one of, he heads the Consciousness Research Center at Hopkins. He was at, doing the original psychedelic research in the 60s and then took that 20 year hiatus and came back at Hopkins. He, he really talks about psychedelics as a door. And so what do you do when the door is open? Do you go in? Do you go walk through the door? Um, but it's a, it's a key and it's important not to mistake it for the main event, you know, Buddhist idea of don't mistake the finger pointing to the moon. So um, we just wanted to ask you all, what do you think nature connection is? What does nature connection mean to you? And or why did you come tonight, or what sparked your curiosity? There is no wrong answer. <laughs> Don't be shy. <laughs> what happened in Shannon's um, so What happens? Um, well, we're apart from that. Yep. Nice. No, that that's that's in a nutshell. That's that's what it's all about. That awareness, that recognition. And of course, we are all that all the time. But but I feel like we've got amnesia of that to varying degrees. Um. All right. Take away. So yeah, I thought. Before we go on, I would define what nature connectedness is according to the, the literature, because it is quite a yeah, complex and multi-dimensional construct. There's a, there's a fair few moving parts to it in the sense that it aspects of cognition, personality traits, emotions, and experiences, so childhood experiences and encounters with nature, all kind of meld and make up one's relationship with uh, connection to nature. And it's been yeah, defined as a sustained awareness of the interrelatedness between one's self and the rest of nature. And as part of that as well, it's also um, related to the value that one places on nature, their relationship with it. Nature-connected people tend to value nature more and they will spend more time out in nature. And that has its whole own suite of implications for health and well-being that are kind of like separate thing to nature connectedness itself. Um, as well as that, um, nature connectedness also encompasses pro-nature attitudes, awareness and behaviours uh, as, as well. Nature connectedness is very important for human health and uh, well-being. So this particular figure here you can see, uh, this is taken from the blog of the head of nature connectedness research at the University of Derby, so Professor Miles Richardson. Um, and this is 
yeah, depiction of um, some of the uh, analyses conducted in a collaborative paper published, I think, in 2020. And what they sort of looked at uh, in this study was sort of different aspects of people's interaction or relationship with nature. So they looked at nature connectedness, but also, uh, yeah, visits to nature, the effect of nearby green space where, to where people were living, uh, watching nature, nature documentaries like David Apple documentaries, and also sort of you know fairly dependable um, associate or predictor of, of well-being, socio-economic status. And what was really interesting and compelling from this study finding uh, findings was nature connectedness had four times the predictive power for eudaimonic well-being. Um, than socio-economic status. And so eudaimonic well-being uh, is a kind of what we might consider a higher form of well-being in that it's centered on self-actualization, finding meaning in life and vitality compared to, say, hedonic well-being, uh, which is more about happiness and feeling good. Nature connectedness is also linked to that. So a separate study found that nature connectedness had a similar effect size related to happiness as, as other kind of key social factors such as income uh, and education. So, and this is just a few studies of, of many um, that kind of show that this is an important aspect of, of people's mental health and well-being. So one way of thinking about it is that the cultivation of nature connectedness is a potential pathway, I feel, to, towards human flourishing. Also, um, relevant to you know, the times that we find ourselves in, um, given that we're in a mass extinction event, the sixth great mass extinction of life on this planet, that we are single-handedly orchestrating as a species, um, nature connectedness is a strong, if not the strongest, psychological predictor of pro-nature awareness, attitudes, um, and behaviours. And it kind of follows as well that the inverse also applies. So a lack of nature connectedness is more likely to predict um, a lack of care or concern or stewardship. Um, for nature. And that, unfortunately, is something that we are afflicted to um, in, the, in the Western world. And it hasn't always been this way, um, and it isn't this way in other parts of the world, um, among other cultures. So we've, we've sort of, there's been a fair few, I would say, disconnected pushbacks um, in the sense when we shifted from hunter-gatherers to, to, to farming, um, Christianity, uh, we used to be more pagan here, and Christianity came in, and, Christ and the Abrahamic religions in general have a very anthropocentric view, and the book of Genesis really kind of lays out that, you know, the animals and the other beings were kind of put there um, to, to, be, to be kind of use how we see fit and that humans are God's chosen children. We are elevated above and beyond and are separate from nature. Then came René Descartes and his, he was informed um, by his own sort of theologic th um, views and he sort of helped you know, form the, the modern scientific method. But his concept of dualism, uh, which kind of slotted quite well into colonialism, industrialization at the time, essentially viewed animals as uh, automata, mindless automata, uh, almost lifeless. It's weird, this weird view of looking at life as this weird, lifeless thing. And only humans possess soul or consciousness or mind. And again, this further sort of like exacerbated this, this disconnect. And, you know, you can argue a lot of positive came from that in the sense of our development, our material, technological progress. Um, but at the same time, that those views and that 
growing alienation, that rift from nature, have also, I feel, done terrible damage to our mental health and to the, the planet. And of course, you know, in other parts of the world, uh, among indigenous groups, um, those, those groups tend to live in a much more kind of nature meshed lives. And when people live in that way, they tend to view, have the view that if you are to inflict damage on your surrounding habitat, on your surrounding environment, you're only going to inflict damage upon yourself. And that's not some kind of woo-woo out there concept. That is basic ecology 101. And unfortunately, we've become untethered and have amnesia of that intuitive knowing. And that's partly why we're in the environmental mess that, that we are. Unfortunately, and depressingly, perhaps slightly unsurprisingly, um, Britain sort of, yeah, is bottom of the pile in terms of our average nature connectedness of a range of European countries um, surveyed. And so, you know, some people might think, you know, oh, us Brits are a, are a nation of nature lovers, but the scientific data kind of does, does paint a bit of a different picture. It gets a little bit worse than this, though. Um, we might be bottom of the pile in Europe for nature connectedness, but we're about bottom of the pile in the world uh, for biodiversity intactness and ecological um, integrity. We are one of the most ecologically degraded, biodiversity depleted parts of planet Earth. Uh, and I feel that these things are likely linked. So one of the factors that's thought to be exacerbating nature disconnect is what has been termed uh, an extinction of experience. This is a diminished potential for everyday interactions uh, with nature. And urbanization has obviously been linked to that as well, but I think overall biodiversity loss has also um, got its role there. I think I've sort of maybe already kind of touched on this, but um, yeah, just to sort of touch on the nature connectedness, at least from the work that we've been, um, well, I've been involved in with others, um, and also some, some previous research has strongly suggested that nature connectedness and say social connectedness, that are not some kind of distinct separate concepts or, or constructs. Uh, they seem to be kind of woven from the same fabric, if you will. Um, and what's interesting, you see interventions, say, that are designed to target, for instance, social connectedness, um, or vice versa, nature connectedness, and you'll see these connectedness gains um, happening anyway in the other form of connectedness that's not being targeted. And we also see it when you administer... Um, psychedelics such as psilocybin therapy for depression. So my friend and colleague, Dr. Ros Watts, who led a study uh, giving psilocybin to people with major depression at Imperial, she did some qualitative interviews um, uh, trying to sort of find out like, what, what's changed uh, for you? How did the psilocybin actually um, help? And what was quite interesting is that independently, Every single person who had the psilocybin therapy and felt they benefited, they, they all felt that they moved from a state of disconnection. So they associated their depression with a state of disconnect from themselves, from others, from world. And the psilocybin acted to sort of like move them towards a state of greater connectedness. And this was interesting as well, that these people had tried multiple therapies, multiple different um, medications to treat their depression. And they actually said that the SSRI antidepressants that they, they'd taken before um, actually exacerbated uh, their disconnect. Um, and you get this emotional numbing uh, with, with SSRIs. They, they take out the, the troughs, but they also kind of take out the peaks. And your emotionality is an important part of your capacity to, to experience connection. We noticed that, um, yeah, so connecting has been seeming to be this broad construct. Um, it seemed almost a bit of a shame having these different, you know, measures such as social connectedness measures or nature connectedness measures that kind of like measure a subsection or a slice 
of what appears to be a broader interconnected construct. So we developed, or based on, on Roz's work that I mentioned, um, this new scale, um, the what's connectedness scale, to particularly kind of assess this broad sense of connectedness to self, to others, and, and the world. Because we feel that this is a, you know, although this came out of psychedelic research, this is far, this has implications far beyond that. Psychedelics haven't sort of conjured connectedness out of, out of thin air. It's not something you need to them. They're just amplifying an underlying construct that's, that's fundamental to, to humans. So now, just to kind of um, give a brief overview of some of the psychedelic research that's been done. Um, so there's a few retrospective survey studies um, that have been done. I mean, I should just set up, say as a preamble that you probably aren't surprised to hear that conducting psychedelic research is pretty tricky. Very expensive. The regulations and red tape are very hard to sort of navigate. So survey studies, although they're not maybe as rigorous as a kind of controlled prospective study design, um, they kind of have their their benefits. They allow you to kind of cast a wide net and bring back lots of data fairly easily, fairly cheaply. But a few of these studies have independently found that lifetime usage of psychedelics is positively associated with uh, nature relatedness, which is another term that comes with nature connectedness. But beyond that, there is also more limited, but there is some prospective research, before and after and long term follow up research. And it's found that psilocybin can catalyze um, long term increases in, in nature relatedness um, and also shift people's relationships to nature and the environment in a positive way. And this it's important to emphasize as well, this seems to be enduring. So this is at least a year um, or, or 18 months. Um, so it seems to sort of potentially result in this fairly sustained or even permanent shift in people, how people kind of relate to, to nature. Um, so ayahuasca um, hasn't, hasn't really been researched that much. I'm actually involved with a psychiatrist collaborator who's collaborating himself with a team and a Shipibo shaman led retreat center in the Peruvian Amazon, and we're looking at the effect of ayahuasca on nature relatedness and connectedness there in that context. Um, and yeah, we've just submitted a paper actually for an agenda. So, but there's not really been much done. But some of the work that has been done has found that ayahuasca users tend to rate more highly in this personality trait, self-transcendence, which is related to openness to experience, one of the big five personality traits, but it's trying to sort of, was made to kind of encompass um, spiritual sort of aspects of personality or spiritual feelings, particularly the feeling of um, encompassing more beyond the, the individual. Uh, so it's hinting at a sort of a wider sense of interconnection. And that's found to be a predictor of nature connectedness and environmental concern. This is a, um, a figure from a collaborative study I was involved in with Imperial. And here we were looking at the number of total lifetime um, experiences with the classical psychedelics um, and people's mean nature relatedness at baseline. And we found a very clear um, effect of total lifetime use of psychedelics and people's uh, uh, nature relatedness. There was a really clear association there. We also found that this was also strongly associated with well-being, um, echoing other, other research. And we found that the experiences of ego dissolution under the psychedelic, so uh, ego dissolution has been defined as the, the, the loss of subjective self-identity. Uh, the brain pops the ego, the sense of self, and under a high dose of psilocybin, it can get pretty wonky or break down altogether. And perceived boundaries between self and other can um, sort of, yeah, kind of relax or dissolve. And that can potentially um, 
be part of this shift in perspective that can leave an indelible mark on people. So these experiences of ego dissolution also seem deeply tied to the, the mystical spiritual experiences that people have. It's like the self, the sense of individual self gets pushed right to the back of the room and that allows for this wider expansion. Uh, so the few sort of testimonials here from people in these trials conducted by Imperial that kind of hint how this, this connection might be experienced during the, the um, psychedelic experience. Before I enjoyed nature, now I feel part of it. Before I was looking at it as a thing, like TV or a painting. You're part of it, there's no separation or distinction, you are it. I felt like sun, sunshine twinkling through leaves, I was nature. I'm also, I've been involved with some qualitative work looking at how psychedelics affect people's relationship to nature, um, their biophilia. Um, I think qualitative work, particularly when it comes to psychedelic research, has got a really important part to play. Not all scientists like it. They like to kind of have things in measured boxes that you can apply heavy duty stats to, and I kind of get it. But the nice thing about the quality approach is you cast this wide net. You're not trying to fit people's experiences in predefined boxes. Yes, it's messy, but life is messy, um, and you kind of honor the human component of that. And we found from that that. Well, there's, there's a few sort of contributing aspects to how psychedelics can influence people's relationships with nature, but primary uh, by far is experiences of interconnectedness that psychedelics make accessible. So experiences of interconnectedness um, with nature under their influence is the primary, seems to be the primary mediator of shifts in people's relationships with nature. Um, this slide was um, part of a presentation from a symposium at Breaking Convention I mentioned by my friend and colleague, Dr. David Luke, and he did some of the first kind of work that sort of drew my attention to this area. And he looked at these various different substances to see um, to what degree they might influence people's connection to nature and their pro-environmental, pro-ecological awareness. And what was sort of interesting um, from this survey study sample was that psilocybin mushrooms, for some reason, were top of the pile. Uh, but you'll notice that uh, if I draw your attention to ketamine, uh, ketamine is kind of like an inverse, uh, it's, a, it's a rampant disconnector, at least according to this survey sample. Ketamine is not going to usher in our ecological age of Aquarius, I'm afraid. But that study caught my interest, and I was like, I was thinking, was that finding that psilocybin mushrooms was top of the pile? Was that a quirk of David's data set? Or is that a more general pattern that for what for some reason applies? So I got kind of like um, emailing researchers, taking a leaf out of the fungi's book and doing a bit of like in my serial of interconnection on the interwebs and email people I knew had data sets looking at the type of psychedelic and how it might um, the association with nature relatedness and that eventually led to yeah five independent data sets being reanalyzed totally um, just over three thousand eight hundred people we just got it finally published a few a few weeks ago and we found that again psilocybin was top of the pile in terms of its association with um, nature relatedness. And not only that, but the three sub-dimensions of nature relatedness. So nature relatedness experience, self, and perspective all had a positive association um, with uh, nature relatedness. And this also applied to psychedelic naive people who only had psilocybin, that there was this, there was a, a positive association. We didn't get it, for instance, with LSD only users. And this wasn't just down to motivation or setting. So it wasn't that people taking psilocybin had greater prior motivation to connect with nature. It wasn't that they were just taking mushrooms in nature more often than the other psychedelics. We found access to nature was very similar for also LSD and ayahuasca. Uh, now, it's important to sort of emphasize this. This is correlative 
evidence <laughs> at this stage. We're not showing a causal relationship here. Uh, that will hopefully be demonstrated in, in, in work that's in the, in the pipeline, and particularly in this, this work. So this is um, some of the data from the Imperial College Insight study. Um, and so this was looking at the effects of psilocybin on healthy psychedelic naive people, so people without any prior psychedelic experience, so a nice blank scientific brain slate to work with, um, and yeah, looking at its effects on their psychology and their brain function. So using MRI scanners to peer into the brain, um, sort of during and then later down the line, and then assessing any shifts in psychology. And you can see on the right there, um, this study is currently being, being written up. We're just waiting on Imperial to give access to some, some um, trial data from a uh, follow-up major depression trial. So then we'll have a clinical sample with major depression and a healthy psychedelic naive sample to analyze and compare. And that will allow us to kind of paint a more rigorous scientific um, picture or even more rigorous narrative. And but what we found was quite interesting was that um, the increase in connectedness to nature following the psilocybin experience was really quite robust. Uh, and actually, it's not really shown in, in, in the, the figure there, but there was this cumulative increase. It wasn't that it just went up. It, it went up and then it continued to sort of go up for a little while. And what's really quite compelling is that the changes were sustained, it seems, as well. So a review paper came out a few months ago looking at adult, adult um, nature connectedness enhancing interventions. And one thing that sort of I kind of noticed that I'd already noticed having a scour of the literature is that there are no follow-up studies looking at the effects of nature connectedness interventions beyond three months. Beyond that, we, have, we don't know how to what degree changes are sustained, which seems quite crazy to me because it's like if we can't demonstrate or if we can't um, come up with interventions that could facilitate long-term shifts in nature connections, then what is the bloody point, really? You know, it's all about the long-term game, in, in my view. And just to, yeah, unpack slightly the, the three dimensions of nature relatedness. So this is a particular measure that's in sort of common usage. It's a 21 item measure, and people are kind of asked about different facets of their relationship with nature. And our experience um, is capturing people's appreciation and value for nature. So it encompasses their, their contact with nature uh, and the degree to which they think that's important. And ourself is particularly keying into that um, self-identification with nature, the degree to which you see yourself as part of it. Um, and our perspective is capturing um, pro-nature conservation attitudes, awareness, behaviours. And two separate studies, um, although our study we found a particular association uh, with psilocybin with all these sub-dimensions, two independent studies have found an association between NR self and NR experience. Now again, it's important to emphasize this is a, a correlative association, so we can't demonstrate that, it, that it's a causal relationship, but it certainly hints that that might be possible. And the, the potential implications of that are that people who are using psychedelics may be um, spend having more contact uh, with nature. And this potentially has huge implications for health and well-being across the human lifespan. Um, there's a really solid evidence base for the mental and physical health effects of contact with nature. Um, and, you know, a little goes a long way. Um, research has shown that time is not an important predictor of nature connectedness, interestingly. It's much more about meaningful moments of, of engagement and appreciation and connection. Um, but even five to ten minutes is sufficient to lower stress, um, improve mood and well-being. Half an hour over the course of a week is associated with reduced depression rates, 
two hours over the course of the week, whether in one go or spread over the course of the, the week, has a kind of robust association with health and well-being. Interestingly, in that study, more than two hours didn't have additive effects to, to health and well-being. So if people are choosing to sort of like spend more time in nature, it has like really potentially profound effects um, on, on health and well-being. So, you know, given what I've said, it's, it's still relatively early days in terms of actual causal evidence for psychedelics affecting nature relatedness or connectedness. That work is in the pipeline, and there will be some, I think, studies coming through, hopefully being published this, this year. Um, but it seems from sort of the data we've got so far that Yes, I mean, it sort of brings up some interesting things when we compare them to mainstream or conventional nature connectedness interventions. So these are things like residential stays in national parks, nature-based educational programs or engagement programs over an extended period, things like this. They tend to be time and resource heavy, and the data says the longer they go on for, the more the kind of residual um, shift in nature connectedness can be sustained. Um, unsurprisingly, their, their, their intentionality is part of them. I mean, people are obviously, you know, using these things specifically with the intent to enhance nature connectedness or, or improve people's relationships with nature. And also, perhaps unsurprisingly, nature is the key focus there. Um, and as I mentioned, we have a, there's a lack of evidence for sustained change beyond three months, uh, simply because no one's actually looked for it. Um, but other interventions do show varying effectiveness. And as mentioned, you know, these, these can be these can take days or weeks in terms of resource investment. Compare that to something like psilocybin, uh, where even a single dose high dose experience, like a four or five hour experience, can potentially elicit rapid, robust, and sustained increases in nature connectedness, lasting at least a year. In the study I was a part of, we found benefit, uh, sustained benefits of two years post experience. Um, and also, you know, this is this shift in people's relationship to nature or connection to it is happening blindly. Um, you know, there's not, it's not part of the pre-flight game plan to sort of brief people like, oh, this experience may fundamentally shift your relationship with nature. It's not like people have been primed for it. Um, and, you know, that psilocybin is not being administered yet, specifically with the intent to do that. It's just happening anyway. But most interesting and mysterious of all is that in comparison to all those other conventional interventions, if you give psilocybin, if you administer it in a clinical setting that's lacking in nature, these changes to people's relationships to nature, their connections to nature, happen anyway, independent of the setting in which it's administered. I mean, we have enough evidence um, to suggest that you know, having access to nature-based settings during a psychedelic experience will add to that. But the fact that a psychedelic like psilocybin can elicit those changes anyway, independent of context, is quite mysterious and unique and special. I mean, I think, you know, we are all nature, and when you have a high dose of a psychedelic, you, you, you're going into your, into your brain, and you're going inwards. It doesn't matter whether you go inwards or outwards, it's nature all the way down or up or sideways. Um, so maybe it's that sort of kind of recognition. Um, you don't need psychedelics to connect with nature. Um, you know, like it really starts with our, our awareness and where we choose to place it. And the foundation of that is um, our attention. So, yeah, and relating to nature connectedness, me and Ranta here hope ask a very pertinent question um, because, yeah, paying attention will really pay you back with regard to your relationship with nature, tuning in to your senses in the present moment when you're out in nature, um, and learning to sort of cultivate that innate human curiosity of the world around us. Um, that's essentially like the foundation on which your, your connection to nature is, is built. Um, 
Albert Hoffman, who some of you might know, is the um, inventor, discoverer of LSD. Um, he also was the first person to isolate and synthesize psilocybin. Uh, so unlocking the psychedelic power of the mushroom in pure form, and he did a lot of other stuff too. He was a lifelong uh, nature lover. He described spontaneous mystical experiences walking in the, in the woods and the Swiss hills in his younger days. And he said, you know, he'd encounter people that would come and thank him and occasionally curse him for having invented LSD. And one of his most famous sort of cherished things was hearing people say things like, uh, before LSD, I was of the city, but after LSD, I'm of the forest. And he came to feel that perhaps the most fundamental property of psychedelics was their capacity to reconnect our nature alienated species back to the interconnected web of life. And looking back at his long life, the mighty age of 101, he said, alienation from nature and the loss of the experience of being part of a living creation is the greatest tragedy of our materialistic era. It is the causative reason for ecological devastation and climate change. Therefore, I attribute absolute highest importance to consciousness change. I regard psychedelics as catalyzers for this. Thank you. So with that, <clears throat> I'll take us into a little bit of what it's like to facilitate psilocybin retreats. And of note, too, if you're interested in qualitative research in psychedelics, there's a paper called Cancer at the Dinner Table, which is quite well done. And it's about the use of psilocybin with cancer patients in palliative care settings. And um, I think it was co-authored by Roland Griffiths, who also was one of the pioneers of psychedelic research. But interpretive phenomenological analysis offers a lot, I think, for if you're interested in research and psychedelics and the qualitative lens, um, quite a way to really deepen and house um, one's kind of hermeneutic, double hermeneutic view in, in one's embodied life experience and pulling from you know, the kind of philosophy of science of, of how that research methodology was developed. I feel like it fits really well. So this is a picture of psilocybin containing truffles within a bowl, and I'll talk a little bit about nature being a core part of both the ceremony itself, preparation, and integration. Um, as I said, I, I work on the retreat team at Synthesis, which is a retreat center in the Netherlands, and so with an incredible team that comes from a variety of traditions, both kind of from a shamanic basis or from a clinical basis, from a therapeutic um, or kind of a wide range, somatic as well. So there's a lot of ways to facilitate um, psychedelic therapy. And I think it's important to not limit it to just, just a clinical view, but it's important, of course, to have, um, well, in our view, to have clinicians on site, certainly. Um, we have, in the last year, I've sat and probably facilitated, I don't know, like several hundred people through um, psilocybin ceremony. And we offer five day long retreats that have a low dose session and then a high dose session. And then we offer integration days in between then. But that starts before even people come on site with three preparation sessions and then three integration sessions. And it's all group based. We have about 20, 25 people that come um, for each five day retreat and about, we have a two to one facilitator to participant ratio. And it's set in this really, really beautiful place that's um, in the kind of woods of the Netherlands, a center called Venvada. And during the summer, we did um, quite a bit of outdoor ceremonies, so it was really amazing to have the opportunity to be nature connected without necessarily trying, and I'm, I'm sure you're all familiar with the idea of set and setting and intention, but um, anecdotally, you know, seeing just how important really how important it was for, for people to have this uh, easy access to nature. And at other times, we do ceremonies inside, but um, it was really beautiful to see the different shifts that happened in people when they had um, ready access. So a lot of people would spend part of their ceremony out on the grass, laying on the grass or, or with the trees. Um, we had someone indoors in a ceremony spending like almost the whole time talking with a potted tree, actually. So none of this is primed. And 
um, you know, not only do we see it's enduring changes happen in people's interest in nature, but in people that maybe have not really been open to that whatsoever. And it seemed to be just a really natural kind of outcome. And I think it's fascinating that psilocybin has kind of raised to the top of the pile, um, as Sam kind of outlined. I mean, I have only worked with psilocybin containing chocolate, so I can't speak from personal experience of how that would differ with other compounds, um, but I can certainly attest to seeing that firsthand over and over again. Um, so I like to kind of imagine what would it be if nature was not just a place that you kind of have a psychedelic experience, but what if nature was a resource in the experience itself and something as Coley, the nature connection team at Synthesis. And so we really design um, and encourage our participants to start creating a really bi-directional kind of relationship with nature before the ceremony even happens. So we'll do that. We have a 10-day retreat this summer. Day one, we invite people to go find a place on the land we'll be at for the next 10 days together. And, you know, simple 20 minutes, spend time introducing yourself to this place, let the place introduce itself back to you, and then let this be a resource through the ceremony, through the preparation and integration. Um, whatever could be an ally, um, not just an objective other. We see how interconnection begins to widen this more subjective experience of interwebbed, intermingled, like cosmic tangled beauty that we're all a part of. And that really can be something that's um, built in by these, this simple practice of finding a place and letting that actual place become kind of this um, opening in which to to deepen and have have a relationship with. So a lot of people, they said, you know, developing that sit spot relationship was actually more important to them even than the ceremony. Or the forest bathing exercise where we did a mindful, you know, 45 minute walk together where we're really pausing and taking in what the sights and smells and sounds are through our senses was more meaningful to them necessarily than the ceremony. And of course, the ceremony itself has opened them to these types of experiences. So who can really say? But um, I find that really fascinating as well, because then people get to go back to their, their places and develop their relationship with nature wherever they are. So it just doesn't become dependent on um, a psychedelic experience necessarily. So kind of as what Sam said, but this idea of what if interconnection really is kind of the main outcome. I mean, we see all kinds of other outcomes, certainly stress. Reducing depression, reducing lifelong chronic pain, changing in people. I mean, all kinds of absolutely beautiful um, outcomes from addressing repressed or um, unintegrated childhood trauma of all kinds. But it's not just the um, interconnection that people experience in their psychedelic experience with whatever's occurring in there, but also in our set and setting with the other people in the group. And that's there's been a measure or a study around this called Communitas, looking at Communitas. And I think that also has a really um, important role to play. You can kind of learn to embody and feel what interconnection really is. Sometimes in this setting with perfect strangers, and by the end of five days, they really do feel like a family. So, you know, we made these little cards, um, prompts for people to go and actually kind of work with a piece of their journey with their sit spot and ask, uh, learn to ask a question, what's emerging, what wants to live in me that I want to share with a sacred place, what does the natural world have to share with me about my journey, um, and it was really beautiful to see what would come from, like, pretty simple questions, um, but actually, like, taking that moment of awareness and mindfulness and attention to really listen and to listen with the full body and so much of what psilocybin can you know well one outcome is a deeper connection with one's body and one's senses that has a lasting effect as well um, and our first language is our sensory capacity and that's the language, arguably, that the earth and the us share. So our ability to be in our bodies, to sense what's occurring, enables us to have a conversation and a language, so to speak, um, with the earth. Another exercise we do is um, post the high dose ceremony. We invite people to go wander out in the beautiful woods for about 
an hour and find a piece of nature that they feel is representative somehow of their journey to bring it back and then to speak as that piece of nature or speak to that piece of nature. And then we do it in this kind of beautiful ritualistic way and they bring it into the center um, of the room. We create an altar out of that. And again, this kind of deepening ability to start actually feeling into, oh, I am the earth. Oh, I am the earth. And practice actually doing that through voice um, can be a really new experience for some and, and quite powerful. Um, so just briefly, you know, the role of rituals, I mentioned one, altars, which really come, you know, one group, the Mazatec, often use altars in their psilocybin ceremony and other altered states to access connection to nature. We're talking quite a bit about psychedelics and psilocybin, but other modalities we use at synthesis, and I'm sure you're all familiar with, but holotropic breath work or circular breathing or um, meditation, um, conscious movement, dance, yoga. There's so many ways to bring us into the body, bring us into our, our inherited belonging of our sensory landscape and language that enables us to connect deeper with the earth, as well as to be able to kind of drop into presence a bit more even being available to what connection with the earth can feel like can feel like if we're caught up in the busy mind and stressed and anxious we miss what's happening right in front of us um so i'm just aware of time yeah so they don't give you a lot of great <laughs> amazing material so i was going to do a little meditation but i think i'll just skip that and ask if you all have any questions, we'll have a few minutes for that. Um, yeah. Well, I have a question. Excuse me. Um, so all the evidence that you've collected seems to be pointing towards psilocybin having this effect more so than other drugs. Is there a kind of working hypothesis for why that might be the case? So there's a few things going on here. So part of it is there's an inherent sampling bias in that psilocybin is by far the most researched psychedelic in modern times. Uh, so that's part of what's going on. Whether, yeah, regarding whether there might be a particular association uh, between psilocybin and nature connectedness, we need to do further perspective controlled research to further kind of unpack that. Um, it's certainly kind of interesting, like we've not got any particular solid explanations as to why that might be, but we do suspect there are cultural factors at play. So a study was published half a year or so ago, um, and it was on a Brazilian sample, uh, looking at nature connectedness and sort of the association with different psychedelics. And interestingly, in that case, um, ayahuasca was top of the pile. And that's obviously, in, in Brazil, ayahuasca is obviously a much more familiar, culturally integrated psychedelic than it is here, whereas psilocybin is kind of our more familiar indigenous psychedelic. So that kind of suggests that cultural factors can come into play uh, a bit, but further work in need is. And this might not even be accurate, so tell me if this is wrong, but the role of self-transcendent emotions, I'm, I'd be curious if awe, for example, um, increases more with psilocybin than others. Yeah. That, because that could be part of the mechanism of change. Yeah, no, it's an interesting, it's something we need to do more work on is like, you know, the pharmacodynamics and like the, in, the, the differences, the subjective differences in felt experience between the different psychedelics might have, might, might sort of have differences and, and stuff, and we need to kind of explore that. It seems like maybe tryptamine psychedelics may be more more prone than, say, phenophylamines uh, of a class of psychedelics. And it seems that awe has a strong association with nature connectedness. So, um, and perhaps some psychedelics are more prone to eliciting experiences of interconnection that I kind of touched on as well. So we need to kind of like delve into this and explore it. Is there research on mechanisms underlying nature connectedness? Do they know what happened and cause that? So, wow, yeah, I mean, because it's a kind of, um, it's a highly personal, subjective um, 
construct, but it shouldn't, that shouldn't sort of diminish its um, power in the fact that it can potentially like shift behavior, even careers and, and lifestyles of people. It can be a powerful thing. Like we know that there are pathways to nature connectedness, feelings of gratitude, compassion towards nature, your emotional relationship with nature, your sensory contact with nature. Um, these are all sort of have been found to be pathways to, to enhance nature connectedness. It's not a detached, objective, scientific like way of looking at the world. It's very emotional and experiential, primarily. One thing I would add, because this is something I'm looking at in my PhD research, is the role of relational attachment in predicting nature connection as a mechanism. So there's some research that's looked at place attachment, <clears throat> which makes sense. So if you're able to bond with place, then you're more likely to be nature connected. So that research has been done, and they also map that onto um, human relational attachment, if you're familiar with attachment theory. So anxious, avoidant, secure, and found, I mean, no surprise, that avoidantly attached people are less likely to have a bond with place and also less likely to be nature connected. So but why, you know, looking more deeply, there's a lot of um, other kind of, um, yeah, predictors I haven't been looked at yet. But yeah, place attachment and relational attachment is something that I'm, I've been interested in. Um, so you mentioned that the uh, intentionality and the sort of setting that people have the experiences in doesn't, there is there is um, still an increase in nature connectedness, even if someone has like a psychedelic experience in say like a very um, a clinical setting rather than in nature. But is there research into how significant that difference is? So if those people were to have it in nature, how much of a difference would there be? Um, no, the, the, the simple answer is no, not yet. Um, that sort of yeah, that's kind of, I guess, the next phase of the research is we, we really need to do a study, a controlled study, comparing the effective setting. Mm -hmm. um, so the survey study that I was a part of with Imperial, we, we sort of, we did account for whether people had access to nature as part of their acute psychedelic experience, and also assessed them on whether they felt it was important for the experience. Um, but that, you know, that spans a very wide bandwidth of potential settings. It could be a, an urban park or, or like a small suburban garden or like being able to like pristine Alaskan wilderness or something like that. So, yeah, we really need to, that's the next stage of the research to try and get a handle on how much the setting can influence things. Yeah, how like nature, con you know, how much nature contact these people have had is ch children and what previous mystical experiences they've had and etc. And what personality type. Sorry. No, go ahead. Um, yeah, I was just going to say thank you for having me. I'm interested in your talk. And I thought um, you both complimented each other uh, very well. Thank you. Um, I know you talk a lot about connection and disconnection, um, but do you think? Talking and using these terms perpetuates the idea that we can be separate from nature. Yeah. 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 It's 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 an interesting conundrum, isn't it? Like we don't want to like sow further seeds of disconnect by framing it in a certain way or using certain loaded words. Um, but it's it's. I guess I would say I think it can be helpful in kind of a progression of developing a kind of um, epistemology of how we're understanding this to start with problem, which is the binary duality of separation, and really examine that myth that has captivated the industrialized West for so long in order to then meaningfully deconstruct that and begin to actually let something else emerge, right? Which is this like beautiful invitation of interconnection, which is really our truth. And so it's back to a circle, right? Where it's the birthright of our belonging. Like that's actually what we are. But I'm curious what it would take to really inhabit that in a meaningful way. And that's not just a cognitive exercise. And I think that's what psychedelics are inviting us into. It's an embodied, it's, a, it's emotional, it's a spiritual, perhaps, 
Um, it's an ontological, um, yeah, question. So, yeah, it's a lot. I mean, I, yeah, but I do see what you're saying in the sense that, you know, I think uh, a lot of indigenous groups or cultures would find the idea of a nature connection scale, like, very odd slash abhorrent. Uh, and, you know, it's like, well, of course we're connect, connected to nature. Like, why, why would you try and, you know, that, measure that? But, like... But we I, don't know that. Yeah. Well, I mean... We're like, really living as if that's not the case. Yeah. Well, yeah. No, no, it's, no, it's true. But, like, to other, other, you know, cultures that live in a very different way, we yeah, we seem to be very out of kilter. And, like, yeah. But, like, I, a researcher recently... Um, connecting with me, she saw some of the psychedelic work, and uh, she's actually developing a nature disconnection scale. Um, because, yeah, she's found from her work that there's a very small minority of people who are basically flatline for, for nature connection. They tend to be male, they tend to be in their early 20s, they tend to be unemployed and living alone and have low uh, life satisfaction unsurprisingly perhaps. And and I kind of yeah, you can see like, well why you know, why would you maybe want to do that? But I feel like if you kind of shine light on like the actual um, aspects of the disconnect, like how how that has occurred, what were the factors that sort of precipitated it, you can then maybe be in a more informed position to kind of do something about it. Uh, I was just going to say, it's interesting that this idea of nature connectedness is very much connected also with a sense of community and that thing very presently in indigenous communities and things like that. But in a country like Britain and many others, those who should technically be most connected with nature, such as people with great use of land, landowners, things like that, are also the people that are so adamant on restricting access of the wider community to our nature spaces. And this is a huge problem with risk. Yeah, yeah. So I wonder if someone, perhaps one of these landowners, you know, whilst they may have a level of nature connectedness, is it something to do with their use of the land and the, the kind of relationship they have with nature, even though they are connected? That relationship might be fundamentally different to someone who believes that nature can just benefit it through uh, mental health, physical health, walking, you know, these sorts of things. So they both have a level of nature connectedness, but the relationship in that is very different, perhaps, so I'm not sure. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I was going to say there's a lot of different scales, um, and scales have obviously their limits, but to look at this idea of nature connection, and one called the love and connection, love and care for nature scale looks at this more from an emotional lens. So the types of, if you're interested, the types of questions that are on these scales really get at the differences of what you're naming. So versus seeing nature really as a resource or a benefit to be exploited versus something that I'm actually in relationship with, more understanding relationship from a human to human lens. Where there's safety, there's trust, there's accountability, there's reciprocity. Um, there's something actually like I'm being asked to give. This relationship isn't one way. So I think uh, my interest is like, how do we get nature connection into something that's really two way, where there's true reciprocity? And reciprocity is something that's not really in any of these scales, <laughs> actually. I mean, we're looking at it kind of as like pro-environmental behaviors or, you know, nature conservation behaviors, that's the way we're giving back or we're in reciprocity. But I still think there's some limits there because it's still kind of missing this relational piece that you're talking about. Um, yeah, so thanks for naming that. Yeah, no, I think it's, yeah, it's an important point. And, and again, I guess it, it kind of keys into the com complexity of nature connectedness and the various different facets that make it up. But, yeah, we, you know, we lived, we live in a very, um, I'm sure you, you've been hearing about the whole Dartmoor landowner thing and trying to like, and it's like, we need to be going the other way from that. You know, Scotland, north of the border, has got, you've got the right to roam, completely different um, potential for accessing nature. And it's, it's a real tragedy. It's all very well, you know, me being here, like, preaching all the benefits of nature. But if we can't, like, actually get out and access it because we're trespassing all the time, like, you know, it's sort of like shooting yourself in the foot a bit. And it's, um, yeah, it's tough. Particularly, we know from the research that um, nature-based settings act as or can act as what has been termed equigenic environments, 
where, so usually um, being like lower income status usually translates to lower health outcomes. Um, whereas access to, nat to, to nature based settings acts as a, as a block for that, as a buffer. It doesn't solve the underlying inequality that gave rise to that, but it, it can help sort of block that effect from, from happening. But unfortunately, in the UK, people, people of lower socioeconomic status have the least likely access to green spaces and, and nature, and then the people who particularly almost um, Which is true elsewhere, need it. too. And, and also, we have a history of, you know, we love to manicure and manage land in this country. We live in a very manicured, manipulated landscape. And if you go up in a plane, you really see it. That's why the concept of rewilding is quite threatening to a lot of landowners. Like, you no, know, we can't just let nature do its thing. You've got to do something, you know? Like, there's this, like, there's centuries of embedded, entrenched feelings towards how the land should be managed. And, and like, you know, and farmers, you know, some farmers are amazing visionary conservationists. Um, you know, working in what is a very, very challenging line of work, but they're also part of an extractive, you know, we, we need to feed billions of people um, on planet Earth. Um, yeah, not, not easy sometimes to make, make things balance. So I'm curious about the potential behavioral outcomes of the nature of connectedness. So both of you referenced the potential for nature connectedness to mobilize action towards the climate crisis, for example. We have a study been done to look at some of the potential behavioral outcomes of increased nature connectedness. Yeah, there's been a lot of work um, that's looked at that. And primarily looking at pro um, pro environmental behavior, both from a public sphere and a private sphere. So public sphere meaning more like activist based, so um, organizing and advocacy and participation in, in policy versus private sphere, like recycling individual kind of behaviors. Um, and, and a new kind of field has emerged as well, so looking at how the nature connection predicts pro-conservation um, behaviors is kind of another separate dimension. I will say that like the science of trying to look like really isolate the best way to understand pro-environmental behaviors is very complicated and very fraught. I've been searching for the best scale for my own studies. Um, but yeah, there's a really durable link and that's quite exciting. Um, it's also very intuitive that you know, if someone's more nature connected, they'll be more likely to want to act on behalf of the planet. But as we know, you know, our individual actions are important, and yet they're very much um, not going to solve this thing. Um, so, what does it look like to hold systems accountable? And you know, I, I, I don't know how nature connection can influence systemic change, but. Um, yeah, there's also more, uh, there's also more good stuff in the <laughs> um, So one thing I'm thinking, I'm just thinking out loud, this part of your question, which is, so it sounds, it feels like there's a lot of intent behind the, behind the use of these substances, and it feels a bit like it's a very Western, like, ideological thing, where it's almost like we, the moment we discover these things, we suddenly want to put a place them and make practical, productive use of them. Well, as if you look at, I mean, the only one I know, the only one I personally know is like Amazonian like cultures, where from their perspective, these are, these are not substances, they're medicines, the medicines have spirit, mm -hmm. the spirit is here to teach us something, but you don't know what that something is, and then you're, it's a very, it's all about reciprocity, like, that's kind of a lovely thing. Well, as from our perspective, we have a problem, which is global warming, we want to solve it, and what should have the answer, like, it's a squid you know, almost consumerist attitude towards, you know, almost like utilizing nature, rather than, you know, some kind of mutual respect or consume it, gain wisdom, or whatever the wisdom does, that, that's where you go. What do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, I really agree with you. And that was what I was trying to kind of frame up at the very beginning of this conversation. But I think the psychedelic renaissance, so to speak, really runs the risk of doing that exact thing that you outlined. And 
the idea that psychedelics are just for individual self-help and you know wellness and awakening, or even to help and fix and save the planet, is still um, you know bio Malafe. I don't know if you're familiar with him. He's an incredible philosopher, a teacher out of West Africa. But he talks about hope as a colonial project. And this idea of saving the world, saving the planet from climate change is even kind of a, it could be argued as a colonial extension. So he talks about what is it to be with a dying world? What is it to actually show up to this mass extinction consciously and with love and with kindness and with heart? And should that change the way we live and act every day? It should. But it's a different approach than trying to save or stop or change something. Um, and, you know, the... So Simon coming out of Mexico with Maria Sabina, like that community used it as mostly healing, healing with finding lost relatives actually, and would be up all night, eyes open, totally different kind of ceremony than this like laying down and like eyes closed going inward thing. So there's lots of other ways for this to be utilized, absolutely. And, you know, with what you're naming, so often indigenous wisdom might say, you know, it will take a lifetime to integrate one journey. Also, so what is it to not be consumeristic about tacking on and piling on all these experiences? What is it to really honor the wisdom that we have been given if you've had the gift of the psychedelic experience and the wisdom granted? So that's something I ask myself, you know, what is it to actually fully honor um, the wisdom that I do have and mature into it before being greedy? But no, I think it's a, it's a good point. And obviously, you know, there's a big difference between how indigenous Amazonian groups use ayahuasca in a much more community-based, nature-based context than, say, a Westerner going out there with a much more individualized take that they're kind of in it for themselves rather than the kind of the, the wider context. And we need to be as well, um, aware as well that psychedelics are not inherently benevolent in the sense that a big part of how they, they maybe work as acting as non-specific psychic amplifiers. So by themselves, they may be not going to kind of like overthrow like systems that aren't really doing us on the planet any favors. They might actually amplify um, pre-existing kind of systems and, pers and perspectives. Um, and yeah, another example on that is obviously the Aztecs were well into the psychedelics, but well into sacrificing human beings as well. So they don't always lead to Benevolent. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> um, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Shall we end? I think yeah. We are um, late now for a, for a dinner re reservation, so we might um, we might. Uh, call but it here's our us. information. There's our Instagrams. So feel free to follow us or email us with any other questions. And yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, thanks. Thanks.